Well, good morning and welcome to everybody. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Michelle Efros, who is the first speaker in SISIT. I think uh, Michelle doesn't need any introduction, but uh, nevertheless, this task was given to me and uh, I have to introduce her, which is a bit strange. So Michelle received um, her bachelor's degree, her master's degree, and her PhD degree all from Stanford University. During her PhD, she worked at various places, uh, including at the uh, Hughes Aircraft Company and uh, also at AT&T. She uh, is extremely well known for uh, in various uh, parts of information theory, including uh, source coding and network coding which uh, she will be talking about today. Um, Michelle is a professor at Caltech, for those of you who don't know it, but of course everybody does. Um, she has been at Caltech um, from the start, so she started as, a, uh, um, as, as an assistant professor and then associate professor, and now she's a full professor of electrical engineering. And uh, well, I think without much ado, let's uh, welcome Michelle. Thank you so much for that uh, introduction and to the organizers for the invitation. I'm extremely honored and privileged um, and feel quite humbled to be here before you today. The title of my talk was chosen to reflect both the optimistic and the pessimistic viewpoint of the field of network source coding. From an optimistic perspective, network source coding is an area with obvious enormous potential for benefits from where we are today to where we'd like to be going. Um, but from a pessimistic perspective, there's a huge gap between those two points. And the path from one to the other is really not clear. So what I'd like to do today is first give a brief introduction to the field of network source coding, and then an even more brief hint at the history and the type of questions that we have been looking at so far. Since my own personal perspective is that perhaps the path from where we are today to where we'd like to be will be accomplished more by asking new kinds of questions than by finding solutions to long-standing types of questions that we've been asking so far. I'll then suggest some very personal and idiosyncratic examples of what other kinds of questions we might consider asking in this field and how those other questions might help us make some progress. And finally, I will finish with some, a summary and some conclusions. So in terms of an introduction, I thought I would take a brief look at three different questions. And the first of those questions is, what is network source coding? Second, why does the network matter? Why should network source coding be any different than any other kind of source coding? And finally, what happens if separation fails? So to talk about network source coding, we should have of course, first remember what source coding is, and source coding is the science of efficient information representation. We talk about two types of source coding. There's the lossless case and the lossy case, and this is the network that Shannon studied in terms of the source coding problem. So we have here a single encoder and a single decoder. The encoder observes a source X and hopes to describe that source to the decoder at some rate of R bits per symbol. If the description is lossless, we mean that the probability of error of the reproduction of a long sequence of uh, these observations should go to zero as the sequence length grows without bound. And in the lossy case, we'll attempt to meet a distortion criterion. It's quite a hike up here. All right. So what is a network source code? A network source code is a source code that attempts to take advantage of the fact that our networks today look a lot less like the network that Shannon studied and, I'm told at least, a lot more like this one. This is a, a model of the internet or networks like the internet that was designed uh, by a recent Caltech PhD. And this picture is courtesy of her. So what is a network source code then? A network source code is a data compression algorithm designed to take advantage of the fact that our networks may have, for example, multiple transmitters, they may have multiple receivers, they may have intermediate nodes, or in fact they may have a vast combination of these different factors. 
Now, in order to understand what the additional advantages that network source coding gives beyond the advantage that source coding gives, let's just briefly remember what kinds of things source codes take advantage of. They take advantages of non-uniformity in your data. If some symbols are more probable than others, we can come up with more efficient descriptions. Likewise, they take advantage of memory in your random processes. And finally, they uh, use simple economies of scale. And network source codes take advantage of all of those factors, but in addition, they take advantage of some factors that don't arise in the network that Shannon studied. And I've chosen three of those to tell you about today. One of them is source dependencies, another functional demands, and the third resource sharing, and I'll tell you about each in turn. So for source dependence, I chose a simple multiple access network as my example. Here we have two transmitters, one observes X, one observes Y, and these transmitters have no means of communicating with each other. The first describes source X at rate RX, the second Y at rate RY, and the decoder gets both of those descriptions and uses them to, in this case, losslessly reconstruct the pair of sources X and Y. We'll assume that X and Y are drawn IID, in fact, I'll use all memoryless examples in this talk and that X and Y are not independent of each other. They have some joint distribution that reflects some statistical dependence. And our question then is, what is the achievable rate region? What rates Rx and Ry can we accomplish in this scenario? And for contrast, let's see first what would happen if we were using a pair of independent codes. So imagine that instead of sending descriptions to the same decoder, they send descriptions, the two encoders send descriptions to independent decoders. Our achievable rate region would be the one drawn here. We need h of x bits to describe source x and h of y for y. In contrast, another thing that we could have done with traditional coding if these two encoders could talk to each other, or if in fact the two sources were available at the same node, would be to use a joint code. And the joint code, of course, would achieve a sum rate of the joint entropy of x and y. And we'd like to understand where in this range of possibilities a multiple access code would be. So Slepian and Wolf studied this question in 1973 and demonstrated that the sum rate of a multiple access source code can be made as low as the sum rate required for joint encoding. That is, we can get a difference between the sum of h of x plus h of y, we can get from that high value down to a much lower value, sum value of h of x comma y, in order to, uh, by taking advantage of the dependencies between these sources. And this is one of the advantages of network source coding. A second advantage comes out in a functional source coding example. And this example looks very much like the example of the previous slide. The difference here is that the decoder now does not want to reconstruct x and y, but instead is interested in some function z of x and y, and uh, doesn't need the exact values of x and y at all. In order to keep this example as simple as possible, I'll assume that source Y is described at its entropy and therefore that it's losslessly available to the decoder. I'll point out, though, that this problem is fundamentally different than the problem that would have arisen if we were interested in reconstructing a source Z equals F of X in Shannon's network where no side information is available to the decoder. The fundamental difference between these two cases is that here the encoder can't calculate the function of interest. It sees only x, therefore can't calculate this function which relies on both x and y, and therefore must describe x to the decoder in some way, but is trying to describe it in a way that doesn't reproduce x necessarily to its lowest distortion, but instead allows us to reproduce the function z to that lowest possible distortion. This problem was studied in the lossless case under the title of Coding for Computing by Orlitsky and Roach, and in the Lossy case later in 2004. And so our question will be, what is the achievable rate distortion region for this example? And I came up with a very simple example to show you to illustrate what kinds of things can happen here. And in particular, I chose my example so that x and y are independent of each other. I chose x to be uniformly distributed on 0 through n minus 1, and y uniformly distributed on 0, 1. I've chosen them to be independent so that we'll have none of the advantage of source dependence that we saw in the previous example. The entire advantage that we see here will come about because of the functional demand. I'll assume that the function that I'm interested in calculating is very simple. It's x plus y mod 2. And I'll use the Hamming distortion measure to measure uh, how well my reproduction reproduces the data. And the question then is, what does the rate distortion region look like? 
Again, for point of comparison, let's imagine that we use the kinds of techniques that we have in effect in most systems today, where the decoder is actually, where our source code is just a source code for X, and therefore our decoder is just going to try and reproduce X as well as possible, and then plug that reproduction into this function F, giving us a new reproduction Z double hat, which is a function of X hat, our reproduction of X, and the side information Y. And ask how well could we do in this case? In this case, the rate distortion region uh, does not rely on the fact that Y is available at the decoder since X and Y are independent of each other. That information doesn't help the decoder from a rate distortion perspective at all. And the rate region looks like this one. If we look at the case where the rate is zero, the best thing that we can do is simply guess what the value is, either zero or one of this binary sum or mod two sum. And we'll be right at best half of the time, which gives us this point right here. In contrast, if we want the distortion to be zero, using the scenario that I've drawn here, the best that we can do is describe the source x losslessly. And describing x losslessly takes log n bits per sample. In between these two points is the curve that I've drawn for you. In contrast, if we go back to the functional source coding problem, what we can notice is that the decoder actually doesn't need to know the value of x precisely. In order to calculate the function, all that it actually requires is to know whether x is even or odd. Knowing whether x is even or odd is sufficient to calculate the function precisely. And therefore, our maximal rate at distortion 0 goes from log n down to log 1. Again, this is another advantage of the network source coding scenario. Here, the advantage comes not because our sources are dependent, but because somehow the information required at the decoder is less than the entire source uh, because of these functional requirements. A third advantage of network source coding comes through what I'll call resource sharing. And to illustrate this point of resource sharing, I've drawn in this case a broadcast network rather than the previous two multiple access networks. Here we have a single encoder. It observes sources X and Y. One receiver hopes to reconstruct X using side information Y, and the other hopes to reconstruct Y using side information X. And to keep things simple and again separate these different effects, I've assumed that X and Y are independent. They're also uniformly distributed on the same alphabet 0 through n minus 1. And the question again is how much rate is required to meet this pair of demands, assuming that the link over which these demands are met is a shared resource between these two receivers. If we treat this problem using traditional techniques, we'll look at each of the receivers separately and notice that to satisfy the first receiver, we would use some rate Rx, which is not helped by the side information Y available at both the encoder and the decoder. Again, X and Y are independent of each other, so we can change our problem to this one. And in this case, it's easy to see that the rate required to describe source X is log n bits per sample. Similarly, for the second receiver, a log n bits per sample would suffice. And so if we imagine satisfying these demands using two independent codes at a rate of Rx plus Ry, we could satisfy both with a total rate of two log n bits per sample. In contrast, though, a network source code can do better. In particular, the rate log n bits per sample is achievable in this particular network. The fact that they have to share this resource does not mean that we have to use twice as much rate across this single link. And there are a number of different ways that you could derive that result. Perhaps the easiest to see is by Alspey, Kai, Lee, and Young. Um, but one way intuitively to see what's going on here is to notice that it suffices to send x plus y mod n across this link. And x plus y mod n is a uniformly distributed random variable distributed on the same alphabet, 0 through n minus 1, and therefore requires only log n bits per symbol to describe, rather than the two log n bits per symbol that we would have gotten using, using traditional source coding techniques. That is, techniques designed for a point-to-point -point network, like the network that Shannon uh, investigated. Now, another question, the third question that I told you I would tell you about in my introduction, is what happens if separation fails? We, of course, all know that in 1948, Shannon demonstrated, at least for the simplest point-to-point -point network, that if we optimally design source codes and optimally design channel codes and put those together, asymptotically we'll do as well as the optimal joint code for this particular network. Unfortunately, the same doesn't hold for all other possible networks. And Cover, Eldemol, and Salehi demonstrated this fact in a 1980 paper. 
that showed for a multiple access networks, it's sometimes possible that the optimal source code and the optimal channel code will not achieve optimal performance. And they used the following example to illustrate this fact. We have here a source now called U1 and U2, and this is its distribution. It has four possible values for that pair, and each of the probabilities of those values is given here. The channel is a multiple access channel that simply adds together the two symbols that it observes from the two encoders and it adds them together in integer arithmetic. So with the inputs of 0 and 1, it can get out either 0, 1, or 2 as the channel output. If you look at the multiple access capacity of this channel and the Slepian and Wolf source coding region for this source, you'll find that those two regions do not overlap, which tells us that if we use an optimal source code and an optimal channel code and put them together for this network, we cannot reliably communicate this particular source over this particular channel. And yet it's easy to see that we can reliably communicate this source over this channel if we use, in fact, no coding at all. That is, if we simply take the inputs 0 and uh, the inputs u1 and u2 and use them as the inputs to our channel, set x1 equal to u1 and x2 equals u2, we'll notice that the sum is unique for every pair of possible values. That is, if we see y equals 0, we'll know that the inputs were 0, 0, y equal 1, we'll know that the inputs were 0, 1, and y equals 2, we'll know that the inputs were 1, 1. And therefore, we can, in fact, reliably communicate this source across this channel. However, optimal separated codes uh, will not achieve that optimal performance. What this example brings up is a question about the very validity of the field of network source coding, or equivalently, the very validity of the field of network channel coding. Should we even worry about things like Slepian and Wolf regions, or multiple access capacities, or broadcast source coding regions, or broadcast capacities, if in fact the optimal strategies that we may come up with will in fact give us suboptimal performance, will make some sources not reliably communicated, uh, or impossible to communicate reliably, in the cases where separation fails. And I'm not sure that one can give a definitive answer to that question, but I thought I would share a few thoughts on that question with you. The first is, of course, as we've seen, that absolutely there are some failures of separation. It's important to point out, though, that there are also some successes. So separation fails when there's some dependence between your sources that the channel can take advantage of. Source codes tend to uh, destroy that dependence, that correlation, and if that correlation would actually have been useful in describing information reliably across your channel, then in fact separation can fail. It's important to remember, though, that separation failing for some examples not, does not imply that separation fails for all examples. For example, there exist channels for which no matter what source you try and send across that channel, uh, separation will always yield an optimal strategy. For example, if we change the previous example from integer arithmetic to binary arithmetic, it turns out that no matter what source you try and send across this channel, separation will give you an optimal strategy. Likewise, there exist sources for which no matter what channel you try and send it across, separated strategies will be optimal. And finally, there exist cases where while neither the source nor the channel has those properties that I just described, some source and channel pairs uh, give you optimality through separate source and channel coding. That is, the source doesn't happen to have the useful kind of correlation that the channel could have taken advantage of. Um, and finally, in cases where separation does fail, there exist cases where we can show that the gap between them, the, what you lose by using separate strategies, is not very large. In any case, um, I think the, the key point here is not does it always succeed or does it always fail, but what is the alternative? Um, we need some point of communication between an application, that is a user who has a source who wants to send it across the network, and the service provider, that is the network itself. They need some point of communication, and traditionally that point of communication has been the rate. That's what they negotiate and decide uh, to the, what they agree upon for sending any particular source across a particular channel. And while joint source and channel coding strategies are certainly interesting, it's hard to see exactly what the alternatives will be in terms of efficient communication between an application and a service provider. Rate seems like a generally interesting uh, possibility and a likely candidate for practical reasons. 
All right, having given you a little bit of an introduction now, I'll next tell you a very small amount about the history of network source coding. And my goal here will not be to tell you the complete collection of results, which is which is really large, and there's some wonderful, powerful results that I apologize I won't touch on that even at all. My goal is to give you more of a flavor of what kinds of questions have traditionally been asked in this field, rather than trying to catalog all of the uh, remarkable results that people have derived over the past 30 plus years. So bri briefly, the history of network source coding is characterized mostly by a search for achievable rate regions or achievable rate distortion regions. And often, this history precedes one network at a time. So for example, the Slepian and Wolf example that I mentioned to you previously was derived in 1973. In 1975, uh, Svede and Kerner developed a variation on this theme, which differs only in the fact that now the decoder isn't interested in reconstructing both of the sources, x and y, but instead wants to reconstruct only x uses y as a helper random variable to allow it to reduce the rate rx uh, required from the first encoder. Weiner, in the same year, published a paper that gives a variation on that theme. The variation here is that now our helper random variable here labeled v is helping two different communication processes, one of which is trying to describe source x, and the other of which is trying to describe source y. In 1980, Chizar and Kerner gave a paper that attempted to give a more general framework for network source coding and more general results about that framework. It included, as special cases, uh, prior results such as the results that I've shown in the previous slides, as well as new cases that hadn't been uh, discussed in previous works. All of the networks studied by Chizar and Kerner had, at least in the way that I'm drawing it, um, could be characterized by bi bipartite graphs. I'm drawing it differently than it's drawn in that paper, but it gives a feeling for what kinds of networks were considered there. Now, the fact that the history of network source coding has occurred at least largely one network at a time is probably not surprising, but may be disturbing to you. Um, at least it's disturbing to me, given the distance between where we're starting and where we'd like to go. Getting there one network at a time is a, a daunting task. And to give you some idea of how daunting it is, the previous examples that I mentioned were all lossless examples. To give you some feeling for lossy examples, um, while the multiple access network was originally studied in 1973, a solution, or at least a, a submission for a solution that is still under review, uh, is only in the pipeline now. So the punchline in looking at this history is that it's a very long way from the network that Shannon studied to the networks that we routine, routinely operate in today. And therefore, if we'd like to make this transition, maybe going one network at a time isn't the right way to go. And that observation leads us to wonder about what are the other possibilities? What are the other questions that we might consider asking that would help us bridge this gap, uh, hopefully more quickly? so that we will make it not just to four node networks and five node networks, but in fact to networks like the internet. And in thinking about alternative questions, again, I'll, I'll mention just some of my own personal interests. These are not the only alternative questions, but there's some questions that I have thought about, and maybe there's some other questions that uh, you've thought about that will help us get there as well. The first question that you might ask is, are rate regions the only thing that we, we should be interested in, or what are the alternatives? Second, if we are interested in rate regions, is solving those rate regions the only way to make progress? Or are there other things that we can do that will help us make progress as well? And finally, if we decide that rate regions are what we're after and solutions is what we're hoping for, then is perfection the only form of solution? Or, or can we get a solution that is less than perfect but still useful? So, in thinking about whether rate regions are what we should really be after, there are a number of challenges that rate regions present. The first is, can we actually find them? And there are many examples where finding them has turned out to be an extremely daunting task that has taken, in fact, decades to accomplish. The second challenge is that even if we can find them, sometimes it's remarkably difficult to calculate them. And my students, I'll give them a little plug here, will talk later in the conference about calculating one achievable rate region this is a rate region which we've known uh, since 1975. We've had a characterization of it. 
And yet actually solving that rate region, calculating the precise values for a given source and a given channel, even when those values are extremely simple, even when the models that we're considering are extremely simple, turns out to be remarkably difficult. It's an optimization problem, and it's not an easy optimization problem. And so even when we can solve these rate regions, it's not obvious whether we can calculate them, and if we can't, how useful they actually are. And finally, if you imagine that we could solve these regions and we could actually calculate these regions, when you get to networks that look like this one, it's not obvious what you would do with that solution once you had it. That is, imagine that someone describes for you the achievable rate region for this network. It would be a subspace of a very high dimensional space, and even describing that thing, much less using that information, strikes me as a daunting uh, task. So you might ask yourself, what are the, the alternatives? What else is there besides rate regions? And another question that you can ask that turns this same sort of question into something much simpler is simply to give yourself a collection of sources and a collection of demands and simply ask, are these demands supportable? Instead of asking now, what is the right subspace of some high dimensional, multi, uh, some high dimensional space, we're now asking a yes or no question. Either you can get these sources across or you can't. A much simpler question to ask. This is precisely the question asked by Asfede, Kai, Lee, and Young in their 2000 paper. They looked at directed acyclic graphs. They imagined that their sources were independent of each other, and they considered the case of multicast, or primarily the case of multicast demands. That is, demands where every receiver that has demands is looking for all of the sources that are available in this network. And what they demonstrated is that if each receiver's demands could be met, if those were the only demands in the network, that is, this receiver's demands can be met when these are our only demands, and likewise for this one, excuse me, and this one, and so on, then in fact, all of the demands can be met simultaneously. Excuse me. So this demonstrates uh, that we can find a very interesting question to an enormous problem without getting rate regions. Notice they haven't told us all possible rate values over all possible links that could be used to accomplish this value. They've just told us that we can, in fact, accomplish this goal. A much simpler question and a very powerful question that has had a great effect on the literature and, in fact, led to this whole field of network coding. Now, in their case, they looked at independent sources, and sometimes people think of independent sources as not being a source coding problem. Um, from my perspective, network coding is a special case of source coding problems for network systems, typically investigated when the sources are independent, but also in some cases we can come up with the corresponding results for dependent sources. The second alternative to the question of uh, are we asking the right questions, is if we are interested in rate regions, we might ask ourselves the question, is solution the only form of progress? And to illustrate that, I've, I've shown an example that will be presented by another student of mine uh, later in this conference, which we call the line network, for the obvious reason that all of the nodes in this network are arranged in a line. The first node observes source X1 and describes information across to the second node. The second node has side information X2 and demand Y2. The third node side information X3 and demand Y3 and so on. And in thinking about how to communicate across this channel, one strategy that you might consider is the following. Imagine that we try and meet each of these demands one at a time. So our goal will first be to simply meet the demand Y2, and since this is a directed graph, the rest of the network is not useful in meeting the demand for Y2. And you can imagine figuring out the rate R1 super 2 required across link 1 to reconstruct this demand uh, Y2. And then once that demand has been met, we can think of that information as side information now available at this node. I'm considering only lossless coding in this example and then ask the question, how much additional rate is required across each of these two links in order to meet the demand Y3 at node 3? And once that demand has been met, we could think of that information as side information now available at this node and ask the question, how much additional rate is required to meet demand Y4, and so on. The collection of rates that you'll find here is always achievable and turns out sometimes to be tight. 
and I'll leave it to Maya to tell you about when it is and is not tight. Let's just assume, though, for now, that this result actually is tight, or consider the cases where it's tight. In the cases where this result is tight, what it tells us is that solving all possible line networks in their most general form turns out to require only solving a simpler class of problems. That is, if we could solve all line problems, all line networks with only one demand, in the cases where the previously mentioned construction is tight, that would give us an achievable rate region for the case of all line networks with demands at any subset of the uh, possible nodes. What that tells us is that there is some sort of equivalence relationship, or at least implication relationships, between these two networks. Whether or not we can find the achievable rate region for this network, I would argue that understanding these kinds of equivalences between networks is a powerful tool. It's analogous in some way to the theory of computer science uh, computability kinds of equivalence classes. Understanding classes of equivalently difficult uh, problems it may be useful for helping us make progress in network source coding problems. Now this is by no means the first example of such an equivalence result or a relationship between networks result. In fact, if we go all the way back to 1980, Chizar and Kerner in developing their general framework for network source coding used a kind of equivalence result there as well. What they did is they showed, and I won't tell you the general result, but just point to an example, they showed that the general source networks in this sort of bipartite model that they relied upon could be, um, for every such network, there exists a corresponding what they call normal source network, such that the achievable rate region for the first network is a projection of the achievable rate region for the second. What that tells us is that this first problem, changing the first network into the second network, in this case, may actually be turning an easier problem into a more difficult problem, but solution of that more difficult problem will, in fact, give you solution to the uh, original problem. The problem here is more difficult because it, the rate region is in a higher dimensional space. Similarly, in a 2006 paper, Doherty and Zeger demonstrated in the network coding literature that if we look at directed acyclic graphs and uh, coding on finite fields, that a network with an arbitrary collection of sources and demands, for every network with an arbitrary collection of sources and demands, there exists a corresponding network. In fact, they gave a construction, and it doesn't look at all like my example. My example is just a picture uh, for the sake of having something to point to. But there exists a corresponding network where all demands are unicast demands, such that solution uh, to the original network problem is achievable if and only if solution to the unicast problem is. And this strikes me as analogous to the kind of completeness results that you see in computer science. It tells us that if we could solve the unicast examples, it would give us solutions to all of the arbitrary demands problems on the other side. This again tells us something about equivalence or implications between network systems that strikes me as another powerful way of achieving progress in network source coding, even if we don't know what the achievable rate regions are. In fact, in this case, sometimes this transition will turn an easier problem into a harder problem, um, but still it, it gives us this implication of which results uh, imply which other results in this field. Finally, the third question that I told you I would tell you about it as an alternative is the question that imagines that yes, in fact, for some reason, really what we want is rate regions. And in fact, what we hope for is to actually solve these rate regions. The final question I'll ask is, is perfection the only means of solution? By which I mean that we have set a very high standard for ourselves as a community. We've asked ourselves to find rate regions and consider the problem solved only when we had them and we had them precisely. And this raises a number of difficulties. First, for real sources, we run into all kinds of problems when trying to solve rate regions. Often, there's no single letter characterization. Our sources in practice often have memory, and therefore, single letter characterizations aren't even possible. Um, the source distributions are often unknown. We don't have the distribution. We just have samples from the distribution. Even when the distribution is known, the optimization inherent in problems like the rate distortion region is often extremely difficult. And finally, many of these regions aren't even solved. 
And so we might ask ourselves, how can we approximate these regions rather than calculating them exactly? And one step back that we can take is to move from rate distortion regions or rate, rate regions to operational rate distortion regions, by which I just mean the best performance you could hope for with an n-dimensional code rather than the best performance that you could hope for in the asymptotic limit. And these Regions have certain advantages. Um, in some cases, we can solve them with low complexity. They're generally more realistic. That is, we won't be coding at infinite dimensions. So if we want to predict how well we'll do in practice, we'd really like to know the operational rate distortion performance for that dimension. Finally, locally optimal solutions are often easy to come by. The downsides, though, of course, are that locally optimal solutions are wonderful, but we're never quite sure how good they actually are. We're never sure whether we're close to the optimal value or very far away. And in fact, finding the optimal value is NP-hard, even in some simple cases. I apologize, this is a typo. It should say k is greater than 1, meaning uh, even for two code words, optimal code design turns out to be an NP-hard problem for the squared error distortion measure. So the alternative that I'd like to suggest is by no means a new alternative, but is relatively new to our literature. And that alternative is to look to step away from a, uh, solving precise values or attempting to solve precise values for these regions and instead to look at approximation algorithms. A 1 plus epsilon approximation algorithm is an algorithm that guarantees a solution, therefore a value, a distortion rate function that will be greater than or equal to the true value, but not too much greater. In fact, if it's a 1 plus epsilon approximation, will guarantee that the performance that we say that comes out of our algorithm is at most a factor 1 plus epsilon bigger than the truly optimal value. And epsilon will be a value that you get to choose. It has to be greater than 0. And the complexity will grow the smaller that you make epsilon. The goal here is to come up with solutions that are not perfect, but are, in fact are provably good. We can often prove that we're close to the solution, even in cases where we have no idea what the true solution actually is. And I thought I'd give you a little bit of a feeling of what some of those problems look like for the case of fixed rate vector quantization, since this is a case that previously appears in the literature. So the idea here is that we're given uh, capital M different samples in our space Rn. In this case, I've drawn R2 because I don't know how to draw Rn for you. They're drawn, these are samples drawn from our distribution. And our goal is to come up with K reproductions for these samples. My reproductions are drawn in red and the samples are drawn in black that minimize the expected distortion between the samples and their closest possible reproduction values. We'd like to come up with the best k code words. In this example, I think I drew eight code words for you for a rate of log k over n bits per sample. Again, k is the number of reproductions and little n here is the dimension of our space. Now, there have been a variety of papers in the uh, computer science literature looking at this problem and coming up with approximation algorithms. And I'll just tell you about two of the more recent examples. The first is a randomized example. And roughly the strategy that they applied is the following. What they showed is that through a very carefully constructed form of randomized subsampling, what they can do is take the original collection of samples and reduce it down to a much smaller number of samples. Remember that the original collection had m samples. The new collection will have m hat samples, where m hat grows as log m raised to the power of 4. This smaller collection of samples has the beautiful property that for any codebook, in fact, not just the best codebook, but for any codebook, the expected performance that you get using that codebook on the original collection of m samples is approximately the same, again, within this factor 1 plus epsilon of the performance that you'll get on the much smaller collection of samples using the same codebook. What that does, that shrinking down of the sample size does, is it allows us to design a code for this much smaller collection of possible samples instead of the original collection, which allows us a much more efficient code design. In fact, they demonstrate a design with complexity that grows linearly in the size of the sample set n. In a paper from 2000, which is a deterministic algorithm, uh, let me just go back one second. The one drawback of the randomized approach, of course, is that it can only guarantee this 1 plus epsilon criterion with high probability. And so it leaves us with this quandary again that we're never quite sure whether we have this 1 plus epsilon solution or not 
for any particular run of the algorithm. In 2000, Matushek came up with a deterministic algorithm to tackle the same problem. And their strategy was quite different. Instead of coming up with a smaller set of possible samples, they came up with a smaller set of possible reproductions, candidate reproductions or candidate code words. The idea here is that in the original problem, any value in R squared in my example or Rn in general is a legitimate possible code word and to find the truly optimal code we perhaps have to consider all uncountably infinite number of those code words. In contrast, what Matushek designed was a collection of a much smaller size, not uncountably infinite, but in fact linear in the size of the sample set, such that if you only use code words from that collection, but in fact use the best K code words from that collection, this finite collection of possible code words, your code book will be guaranteed to be within a factor one plus epsilon of that truly optimal performance. And since they used a deterministic construction, they're guaranteeing that one plus epsilon uh, factor with probability one instead of in high probability. Um, their code book size does, however, grow linearly with M, and therefore the complexity of their algorithm is uh, super linear. It's a little bit slower than linear. In 2004, we looked at the same problem and actually used ideas from both of these sides of the picture. We both found a smaller collection of samples that we could consider and a smaller collection of candidate code words. And for the, in the interest of time, I'll only tell you about the uh, collection of candidate code words that we use. Our construction was deterministic, uh, like the construction of Matushek, and therefore guarantees this one plus epsilon approximation factor. Um, a key difference, though, between our construct construction and the prior constructions is that both our set of candidate code words and our collection of sample points, the smaller collection of sample points, have sizes that don't grow at all with the size of your sample set n. They depend on the approximation constant epsilon, how accurately you're trying to approximate the true value. They depend on the dimension of your space, and they depend on the number of code words, but they don't depend at all on the number of samples for which you're trying to design this code, which actually gives us a mechanism in some cases for designing codes for continuous distributions as well as discrete distributions, but I won't tell you uh, any more details about that. What instead I'll use the remainder of my time for is just to give you at least a little bit of feel for how our construction works. And basically the first step of the algorithm is to take our space and to divide it up. We'll divide it up in a recursive process. Here I've drawn quad trees in dimension two. They would be the equivalent of quad trees in higher dimensions um, as you work your way up. So we divide our space in half in every dimension and then a half, a half, in half again in every dimension and so on. This division process is attempting to create a collection of what we call light regions, where a light region is simply a region where the distortion of all the samples that fall into that region relative to the centroid of those samples is small. Now, it turns out that if you try this division process uh, brute force, then you can run into trouble in cases where there are very small but high, high number of sample regions inside a, a large section. Dividing and further dividing just to get down to one heavy region turns out to be too expensive in terms of the total number of regions required. And so in addition to these very simple uh, quad tree kinds of divisions, we allow ourselves some altered splits, where an altered split is constructed simply by taking the one heavy region. If you perform a split and you get zero heavy regions, you're done. If you perform a split and you get two or more heavy regions, we'll consider ourselves done, we'll leave that region alone. But if you perform a split and get only one heavy region, we'll modify that region until at least one of its neighbors becomes heavy as well. And we'll do that very simply by just shrinking that region down until one of its neighbors becomes, just hits that border of heaviness. Um, we'll do this in a very careful way that keeps it so that the regions that we'll be asked to further divide are all cubes in n-dimensional space and that the neighbors um, have this property that we call the fatness. Um, it's a property inherited from the literature. There's a lot of fat and heavy in this, uh, in this topic, which strikes me as strange. But in any case, um, so that these regions will have 
won't turn into slivers, and that turns out to be important to our counting argument. The key is, that to, is to demonstrate that we can perform this process with a number of regions that, again, may grow with k, epsilon, and n, the number of code words that we're trying to design, the dimension that we're in, and the approximation factor, but doesn't grow with the number of samples. And we use two types of arguments to demonstrate that the number of regions can be small in this way. One type of argument is to look at some regions and to observe that they must contribute some uh, small but finite amount to our total distortion, at least some amount. And there can only be a certain number of regions that contribute this uh, relatively large distortion to our final calculation. That gives us a means of bounding how many of those regions there may be. The other is to bound by volume, to notice that some of these regions must be taking up a significant amount of the total volume available in the space. Again, there can only be so many of those possibilities. And uh, that allows us to bound the, the, remaining, the number of remaining regions. Once we're done with this process, we take each of these regions and replace all of the samples in that region by a single point. And what that does is it gives us a characterization of roughly where the probability is in this space. This is not a good candidate collection of code words, though, for the following reason. I really wish I had a pointer right now. Um, imagine, if you will, that I'm pointing at the, the dot in the top left-hand corner here. That's one possible reproduction. And imagine, I'm sorry, one subset of the data. And the, the point in the square just below is another subset of data. And if we were trying to try and put these two values together into a single code cell and come up with a good reproduction for that code cell, neither of those values would be a good candidate. That is, each is representative of some subset of the original distribution, but in order to come up with a good code word, we'd need some value in between those possibilities. And so the final step of our construction of this class of candidate code words, oh, you can't see it, is to put a cloud of uh, points around each of those points, and I'm sure that that is absolutely invisible to you. But imagine that you can see sort of a cloud, a fixed finite number of points around each of these centroid values. We do that not just for one of them, but in fact for all of them. And the clouds are all identical to each other, and the diameters are chosen to somehow reflect the relative distances between any pair of points. The result is a collection of candidate code words, and that collection is finite. And what it, oh, I'm done anyway, but thank you. What it, uh, what this finite collection of candidate code words gives us is an algorithm for code design or approximation of the rate distortion function that is linear in M. M, of course, is the number of samples. In particular, this is the actual complexity of our algorithm or the approximate complexity of our algorithm. The end result, though, the key, is that what we get here is provably good performance which is something that we haven't had before these approximation algorithms. We've had locally optimal performance, but we never know for sure or don't usually know for sure how far our local optimum is from the global optimum. Here, we have no idea what the final answer is, but we know that we're within a factor one plus epsilon of that optimal performance, and we got to choose epsilon. Um, in fact, we found these approximation algorithms to the rate distortion function by actually designing codes. So in addition to having approximation algorithms for uh, approximating these curves, we actually have code designs as well. Um, and this not only gives us knowledge of what the operational rate distortion function looks like, but because our algorithm is deterministic, we know that we know it, which is something that has been missing from many prior algorithms. And then the final point to make about our algorithm in particular, um, in contrast to the algorithms that precedes, is that it generalizes to general network systems. That is, there's a large class of possible networks for which we can now design candidate code words. And uh, this concludes this particular topic. So finally, to get to the summary and conclusions, um, the key point that I've been focusing on today is the fact that it's a long, long road from the original network source coding problems, such as the one that was studied by Slepian and Wolf, to the kinds of networks that we routinely operate in today, such as the internet. And from my perspective, at least, it strikes me as time to question the questions. That is, the questions that we have traditionally looked at have been almost exclusively, although not entirely exclusively, about achievable rate regions. 
And maybe those aren't the only ways to make progress, finding these achievable rate regions. I've given some possible alternatives. They're by no, no means the only possible alternatives. But to remind you of the alternatives that I've mentioned today, one is this question of supportability, asking simply, can a collection of demands be supported without characterizing all possible rates at which they could be supported? The second is the question of equivalence classes. Can we take the family of all possible network source coding problems and divide them up into subclasses of problems for which finding the solution to one of those problems will give us solutions to the others or solutions to larger subclasses of possibilities? And finally, approximation algorithms. In cases where we actually do want to calculate rate regions, do we really need to calculate these things precisely? Or is it sufficient to approximate those true values especially if we can guarantee that our approximations are good. That concludes my talk. Thank you all for your time. Michelle, thanks a lot for a very, very nice talk, Jody, very much. Uh, you have the opportunity to ask questions, and uh, there are people here with microphones that uh, are provided. So. Before we question the questions, perhaps we can ask questions. So where does intelligence in the network come in? Can, can you somehow characterize how much that would help uh, in the source network coding? So by intelligence in the network, you mean? Computation. Computation. So all of these problems involve distributed computation of a sort. That is, in order to accomplish network source coding objectives, we're often asking intermediate nodes to do coding, as well as the nodes on the edges. Um, without that, we end up with a much restricted collection of possible problems. And the gap between the problems where we allow that kind of coding at intermediate nodes and when we don't um, can be extremely large in some cases. So in that sense, we're using intelligence everywhere in our network in all of these examples. On the other hand, it, it's a very restricted form of intelligence. That is, we're not assuming that these nodes are computing the right code to be used, that kind of thing. We're often handing them codes, and therefore they're not, no node is having to learn all of the statistics of the entire network, that kind of thing. Um, how much additional power that would give you, um, it would probably give you additional power in terms of things like universality, um, being able to learn the statistics from a network as a whole um, might involve that higher level of intelligence. Thank you. It's a bit hard to see who's, uh, who's showing up because of the lights, but I trust that uh, more questions. Stunned silence. You've all understood everything perfectly, and therefore, go home. There will be a quiz. To your friends and family. <laughs> Uh, in your last pro problem, you showed the complexity and you mentioned it is an advantage that it is not uh, dependent on the number of points. Uh, but it had a um, term end to the end, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, if n is in the order of 100, then uh, do you see this as a problem? or? Yeah, so the question was about the complexity of our algorithm. You'll notice here that we have a term in our complexity which it, it's actually a term that's independent of the sample size, the number of samples for which we're trying to design a code. Only the first term depends on n. But it, in fact, does grow like n to the n. In fact, n over epsilon to the n. And certainly, we would be happy to have lower complexity if we could. One thing to point out is that we can't hope for complexity that is anything less than exponential in the dimension. And the reason that we can't hope for that is even the number of code words for a fixed rate is exponential in the coding dimension n. So even the number of code words is growing exponentially. Obviously, we would like something faster if we could. But what we have here is basically uh, some constant to the n log n, which is just slightly faster than the growth rate of the number of code words itself. So uh, I don't think that we could hope for much smaller. But certainly, if something smaller were available, we would be we would be happy to take advantage of that. There's a question over there. 
don't know. Is that? Yeah. Can I ask this question? I don't know where the voice is coming from, but <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, I have two questions. Number one, uh, when you said perfection, is perfection the only solution? You switched from the rate region to characterizing a block and rate distortion function to within one plus epsilon. Right. So it's, there seems to be a problem in between in the sense that we can still stick to the rate region, but we can ask whether we can characterize within an epsilon of the yeah. rate region. Yeah, in fact, um, for ITW, I'll give another plug here. For ITW in Lake Tahoe, <laughs> for those of you who will be there, we'll show an approximation algorithm for a rate region itself, not an n-dimensional opta. Uh, operational rate distortion function, but a rate region for a lossless case for which we now have an approximation algorithm. So yes, we're interested in those problems as well. This was just one example. Okay, good. Second question is, uh, you didn't talk much about applications in this talk, but can you give us some sense of where you think these network source coding ideas will have the biggest impact in practice. Yeah, so one of the places where they'll have a big impact soon, I think, is in the field of network coding, which people view from different perspectives, and I'm not really interested in the semantics of it, but networks, network coding, by my characterization, falls as one example of a network source coding problem. And this is a case where you don't need to know anything about source dependence, or at least uh, to get the independent coding kinds of results. You're not taking advantage of source independence. And it seems to me that this is the place where we'll have advantages probably most quickly. Other examples that are already sort of in the works are multi-resolution source codes. These are source codes designed for lossy examples with one transmitter and many receivers. And these are, are very commonly in use um, all over the place. We have multi-resolution codes on all of our computers today. But in terms of biggest impact, I think the biggest impact is still um, some ways off because of the fact that we have a long ways to go as a community. Um, there are many cases where we gather information that is dependent in some way. Here's a simple example. Imagine the uh, acknowledgments and uh, acts and knacks traversing your, your uh, computer network all the time. These things are likely highly correlated values and we send spend some amount of the resources of our network just sending this kind of uh, processing information along with the information that we try and communicate. As we try and, or we get to the point where we develop more efficient codes, I think these things can have a lot of impact, but we're still some distance off from that goal, so. Okay, Amina. Given your experience with preparing the talk and the questions we heard, uh, how optimistic are you that this community will question the questions? <laughs> um, I'm optimistic. So I think that these kinds of questions are not new. In fact, I hope that I did not give you the impression that they're new. These are questions that have been out there and are just now, some of them starting to take a hold. And my hope is that just more of them will. For example, the network coding question of supportability rather than achievable rate regions has by all means taken hold. And this community has embraced that question uh, wholeheartedly. And I, I just hope to encourage people to think more about other possibilities that will likewise help us to get similarly uh, powerful gains. Because the impact of that small switch, or at least intuitively seemingly small switch, has been remarkable. Um, and so hopefully some of these other questions that we'll come up with will likewise be remarkable. And I, I think this community is ready to think about some of those possibilities. I hope I'm right about that. Where is the micro? <laughs> so maybe perhaps I can ask a question. Um, Actually, it, it uh, has two parts. One is, uh, what do you think? Do you think there will be complete problems in this field? Complete. Like, like NP complete problems, so a class of problems, such that if you can solve them, then you can solve everything. And moreover, for which there is perhaps like an NP, um, some kind of a witness that gives you a short proof of optimality. Right. 
Um, there absolutely are NP hard problems in this class of problems. Even fixed rate vector quantizer design with just two code words, remarkably enough, is an NP hard problem. So yes, there will be. There will be problems where not only uh, the optimal solution is NP hard, but where even approximation is NP hard. And because some of these problems are the same kinds of questions that are already studied in computer science, they inherit some of those same kinds of witnesses. Um, in terms of not NP hardness, but other kinds of complexity results where we talk about not computational complexity, but maybe something we could call network complexity, I think that there likewise will be analogies. In fact, I think that the zieger doherty result, or I guess it's doherty zieger result, um, sort of hints at that possibility, that maybe the multiple unicast problem will turn out to be the equivalent of the, the NP hard problem, but now instead of NP hard, it's somehow network hard or network complete kind of uh, network example. That actually also answered my second question. Well, uh, <laughs> let's thank the speaker again. <laughs>